This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is brought to you by Lexipol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexipol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzow. I'm a firefighter and training officer from Madison, Wisconsin. With me, as always, is Janelle Fasquette, who is the editor-in-chief, Fire Rescue One. She is the captain. She's what drives this podcast that we call the Better Every Shift podcast. How are we doing today, Janelle? I'm doing great. I'm excited for today's discussion. Well, with us today, and we're going to talk a little health and wellness, so obviously I have a little snicker and uh, gleam in my eye, because that seems to be one of the things I'm okay at talking about. We have uh, with us Chief Todd LaDuke. He is down in Florida, where it is not a dry heat. It is just plain hot. Chief, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Aaron. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I've uh, followed and know, know both of you uh, for a uh, number of years, and, and I'm excited uh, to to have a great conversation today. So thanks for uh, inviting me on. Well, we're we're super excited to have you here because uh, again, we're going to talk a little health and fitness and and wellness, and hopefully give some people some applicable takeaways to um, help them improve performance and career longevity. Um, and that's that's really what you've been doing for most of your career. You've been uh, a, a chief strategy officer uh, with LifeScan Wellness Centers for some time now. They they work on early detection um, and disease screening for for public safety um, uh, members. You're also a board member for the IFC Safety, Health, and Survival section. You've previously served uh, over 30 years, I believe, with Broward Sheriff Fire Rescue in Florida. Uh, you've served as the executive uh, assistant fire chief, executive liaison to the fire chief. You also hold a master's degree in executive fire service leadership, credentialed as a CFO, certified emergency manager and, and fellow of the Institute of Fire Engineers. You're also you've served as a faculty um, and uh, you're apparently very, very bad at retirement. Is that correct? That is a uh, guilty as charged. Uh probably like most of your listeners out there, type A personality and uh, can only play so much golf. So uh, yeah, I've got still the passion burning in me and uh, trying to give back to the service. Uh, and so the the service came calling back after one day of golf. Yeah. <laughs> As you were telling this story, you're out of the golf course, you get a call to, to, to work with uh, LifeScan Wellness Centers and um, which they they do early detection, which has been a passion of yours, um, and I've been following you for for quite a while on it. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Where did that passion start? As to to looking at okay, here are these huge health issues in the fire service, and we can really get ahead of them by doing this by early detection and, and physical. So where did that passion start with you? Yeah, great great question, Aaron. Uh, thanks for thanks for asking. Um, you know, to be to be honest with you, you know, you you mentioned um, some of the work I've been humbled to be involved in with um, IFC and National Fallen Firefighters and um, research projects over the year. But really, um, to be honest, and this probably hits home, I would think, to m most all departments in the country. Uh, you know, at Broward, um, we've lost a number of uh, firefighters um, over the years. We we memorialize them. Um, uh, actually in the entrance to our administrative offices um, with um, with their pictures and, and um, you know, their service. Um, and, and I say this when I present, I, I've attended, as I'm sure, like perhaps both of you and some of your listeners, far more funerals um, than I ever anticipated when I signed up in the fire service and certainly when I became a chief officer. Um, and, and attended, you know, far too many bedside uh, hospital visits. And in my own department, when I looked at pretty much almost every single one of the um, members that we lost, um, if we were being honest, in, in hindsight, um, there were probably things that we could have done as a fire service um, to have perhaps, perhaps, prevented those. And, and, and I think that plays out if we, you know, if we look at, um, you know, our NIOSH line of duty reports, um, you know, we honor people's memory and, and listen, inherently, 
Um, you know this being a firefighter. Um, public safety is inherently a dangerous profession. Uh, we try to minimize um, the risk and maximize the, the gains. Um, and we're not always able to do that successfully. Uh, but we knew that when we signed up. But there, there are a tremendous amount, particularly on the health and wellness front, of risk that we can successfully manage, prevent, and um, intervene to have a great outcome. So it was really personal with myself. And, and I guess maybe that's what drives the passion because I think, you know, I was with Broward, uh, as you pointed out, the three decades, and I, I worked for about four years before that up in Massachusetts. Um, and um, so, uh, almost i think all but one member of broward that we've lost um you know i worked alongside new um and, and served with so um and, and i know that's the same for every department you know when when you suffer a loss and whether it was a cancer a death or you know a cardiac um, disability or death or, or suicide um when we look at those there's opportunities um to to take some practices, some uh, models that are out there that we can put in place, maybe to make a bigger impact. And don't get me wrong, I think we are making tremendous inroads. I, I'm sure you, like myself, I mean, I tell people all the time, you know, when I when I was doing conference speaking on health and safety for firefighters three decades ago, there'd be one person in the room at FDIC or IFC, FRI, or um, you know, today it's it's just the opposite. It's almost standing room only. So it, it is changing, and it's you know through the work of uh, folks like Janelle, yourself, um, Lexapol, Fire Rescue One, all the all the stakeholders that are are really um, making making some great inroads culturally in uh, a healthier and safer fire service. Yes, yeah, so you you mentioned too. I, I I like that minimize. We right on the fire ground. We try to minimize our risk, right? But we, we still, you know, risk little, save little, risk a lot to save a lot. But how come that hasn't transferred to our own health and wellness? What are we missing there? Because, right, like, isn't one of the biggest things when you look at the NIOSH reports and, and the line of duty deaths, we're not minimizing our own risks personally, right? Where's the disconnect? You know, I think it's probably several fold. Um, what's the, the saying? You know, not all superheroes wear capes. Um, so I, I think part of it is us, um, and it's it's normal, right? Most people don't look forward to going to, whether it's the dentist or their primary care provider. Um, but we know that um, the risk that we face to our health is has much greater um, consequences than other professions. So, um, so I think one, it's, it's culturally, both from a leadership standpoint and at, at a personal level, right? Because um, when Mrs. Smith, to, to borrow a term from um, Chief Brunacini, God rest his soul, um, calls 911 and says, my house is on fire. Mrs. Smith expects, you know, a well-equipped, a well-trained and a healthy and safe response, right? And that starts with our own personal, if we can't save ourselves, um, we're going to have trouble saving others. Secondly, it, it's a, in my humble opinion, I say this very humbly, it's a leadership cultural issue. I hear all the time um, from different corners of the, of the first responder community that it's too expensive, it's too much work, we can't afford physicals, we can't afford a, a health and safety program. The, the first response I have back is let me see a copy of um, your repair and maintenance budget mm -hmm. for your apparatus. Um, and whether they have a budget, they don't have a budget, they don't have a budget. I said, give me your invoices on how much you've spent because we would never, I, I don't think, I, you know, pretty confident in saying this, that we would ever put three or four or five firefighters and send them to Mr. Smith knowingly in an engine that has spongy brakes, bald tires, windshield wipers that don't work. Um, and we need to translate that same mindset to our personnel. I mean, it's it's kind of cliche that, you know, we you hear leadership um, um, gurus talking about your most valuable um, asset is your people, right? Um, but, you know, my mother taught me a long time ago, my parents, um, a great upbringing, you know, that actions speak loud in the words. So we have to align what we're saying with what we're doing. Um, so I, I think not to be long winded, but I, I see this a lot in, in the service where 
Um, and, and I think it's natural. You know, you've got organizations out there that are high performing, um, that are leading the way. Uh, you've got other organizations that maybe need a lot of work. And then you've got a bunch in, in any you know, scenario that are that are in the middle, just looking for what are those best best practices? How do we implement them? What what's the formula? So, um, I, I think if we can kind of take some of the folks that are doing great things out there and sprinkle that all throughout the rest of the service, we will find ourselves in a great spot. Yeah, I I uh, can relate uh, to your statement about you know ten twelve years ago being you know one of the first and only talking about health and fitness. I think you were the other. It was you and I uh, to begin, and now you have, you know, uh, uh, rooms uh, talking about cancer, cardiac, suicide, uh, you, you know, uh, you name it. Um, you know, you also mentioned, I think, leadership. We're, we're recognizing we need to do this, but now it's time to start taking more action. And let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So let's say I'm, I'm a fire chief or I'm, I'm someone that's, that's interested in trying to help change kind of my culture of, of, of even my own culture, my cruise culture and my, that of my department, what, what would you say, let's start with these three things, you know, as a department, what are three things that every department needs to start to focus on? Sure. And, and that, um, you know, from a 30,000 foot level, right? Because yeah. yep. every, every department, every individual is probably on a different leg of their journey. Um, and it's, it's continuous, right? So you don't just get to the top of the mountain and stop, you, you know, figure out what's next. Um, but I, but I would think you know the first step um, is um, awareness, right? So we need to we need to get a better understanding throughout not just leadership but through labor and through um, individual firefighters on what the challenges are. Um, so folks like Janelle, you, myself, off the top of our head, you know, can probably tell you that. Uh, you know, we still lose about 52% of firefighters from uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, the statistics say, you know, uh, for each one of those, there's 27 others that have a disabling cardiac condition. So they survive, but they're not going to be firefighters any longer. Um, there's literature out there saying um, uh, at least one study that, you know, a significant portion, uh, I think was 40 some odd percent of firefighters will think of, it's called suicide ideation, think about suicide. Mm -hmm. um, that same study, I believe, said 16% actually self-reported that they attempted um, suicide. So, and those are self-reported, right? So who wants to stand up and say, hey, I'm thinking about suicide or, hey, even more, I, I actually tried to commit suicide. So, you know, the belief is those are probably underreported. Um, cancer, you know, we're talking about it, but, um, you know, does the average firefighter know that they are, um, uh, you know, eight, nine times um, more likely than the general population to develop cancer overall? Certain cancers are much higher than that. And 14% more likely to die from the cancer um, than other professions because the cancers are more aggressive um, from our exposures. So I think the first step, and I could go on and on, right? You, you could oh, talk about- This is great, yeah. You could talk about the 80,000 uh, orthopedic musculoskeletal injuries a year, and what we need to do about that. We can talk about alcohol um, abuse and prevalence in the fire service. We can talk about sleep issues. So I think the first step in, in answer to your question is we've got to we've got to have a level playing field. So we all know what the issues are that need to be addressed. Um, then the second uh, process of that um, is really, and I'm a big believer in don't recreate the wheel. Um, if there's someone out there that's already built, um, you know, the golden goose, go find it. Ask them for permission to emulate it, you know, called, I guess, in accreditation circles, benchmarking. And, you know, I call uh, it the highest form of flattery when you, you know, ask someone to uh, take what they've already created and learn what they, what worked, what didn't work. So there's programs out there. The IFF has great resources, National Volunteer Fire Council, IFC, uh, National Fallen Firefighters. It can go on down the whole alphabet soup of the fire service. Um, U.S. Fire Administration, our new U.S. Fire Administrator, hyper-focused on uh, one message, one voice, right? My dear friend, Dr. Lori Merrill Moore. Um, so don't recreate the, the wheel. Um, there's a lot of resources out there that you can plug and play. You might have to fine-tune them a little bit for the nuances of your jurisdiction um, in your culture. But um, So that would be the second step. And then I, I guess I will reiterate what I said before is in, in my humble opinion, the third um, step is, is having to prioritize, 
Right. So um, we have to do a lot of things in today's all hazard responder world. Um, you know, we've got to be good at training. We've got to be good at community risk reduction. We've got to be good at, you know, response. We've got to have a hazmat component, a technical rescue. Um, but a, a wise chief taught me um, very early on that if you don't have um, healthy and safe firefighters, you don't have a fire department. Um, so kind of back to the, um, the analogy of how much are we spending on preventative maintenance? Um, in my humble opinion, I think the, the foundation has to be, are we taking care of our firefighters from the moment they decide they want to be part of the service? So are we making sure that, you know, we talk to them about behavioral health? Are we making sure we involve the family and what, what it is to be the family nucleus of a first responder? Do we talk to them about sleep? You, you asked me about sleep before we started taping. I mean, that's something that, um, I mean, Aaron, how long have you been in the fire service? Uh, almost 20, well, 20 some years actually. Yeah. Between volunteer and, and career. Yeah. So I'm pretty willing to bet that like me, when you started, no one sat you down and said, Hey, listen, here's the deal. As a first responder, you're going to have horrible sleep. You're going to have excess obesity. Uh, drinking is highly prevalent. You might have behavioral health, PTSD issues, uh, cancers through the roof, um, sudden cardiac events from heat stress. Um, so, you know, that has to start at the very beginning. I, maybe that's the reason they never put me in charge of recruiting because no one would join <laughs> right. the fire yeah. service. But, you know, the first step to fixing a problem, right, is acknowledging what the problems are. So um, if we have that culture from the day one, and then we're always plugging away at making sure we've got the tools and the resources, not just for the firefighter, but for the family and a support network. Um, I think that's how we get people through the service safely, healthy, and get them into a long and, and prosperous retirement. You know, one quick observation I wanted to make with, you know, when we were talking about the leadership component, you said we were talking about the numbers game, right? And the apparatus and how much it costs to maintain the apparatus and the analogy to maintaining health and wellness. Isn't it so interesting that when it comes to the leadership angle, we're talking in numbers, right? It's like you're coming at them with data, but really at the end of the day, it's about protecting your people and doing what's right. And sometimes the best way to reach certain people is going to be through the numbers. But at the, on the other hand, there's the personal accountability component. And there's, like I said, it's just doing the right thing and wanting your members to go home at the end of the day. So it's, it's sort of like there's the, the sort of colder approach, the numbers based approach, but then there's the very personal element that we have to get everyone on the same page with as well. I mean, the numbers might get us there, but there's a very personal component as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Janelle. And um, everyone sees the world sometimes through different lenses, right? So everyone's a different learning style uh, in many cases. So uh, I think we're saying the same thing that likely it's probably a combination of both, right? And I, and I know um, as a fire chief in today's world or a chief officer, um, you've got so much on your plate to balance um, that that sometimes it's not intentional. It's just, it's not front and center on the radar screen. And I've seen, you know, the point that you just made play out firsthand at LifeScan. We had, uh, I won't, I won't say the name of the department or the chief, but you know, a large um, Metro department um, with an old salty chief. He probably was listening. He'd be fine if I said his name, uh, an old salty Marine Grunt, who, who came up through the ranks and became fire chief at the Metro Fire Chiefs Conference. He went through LifeScan uh, physical, and as part of that physical, we, we actually, and we do ultrasound imaging, we actually found a, a kidney mass, which turned out to be renal carcinoma. Um, you know, he was asymptomatic, a normal 1582 physical would have missed it. Um, and, and that changed as a leader that changed his his world. He came back, um, self-admittedly, the department wasn't really focused on health and wellness. And he made that his mission. Um, everything from, you know, clean gear to, you know, clean helmet, to all the all the stuff that we talk about. So, so I think in, in many chiefs, you know, get that from, you know, lose, unfortunately, losing a member 
Um, you know, I've seen, you know, all too often where um, there were really not robust behavioral health resources in place, then we have a tragedy um, and we react to it. So um, I, I think my goal out there is kind of um, trying, and I know this is great that um, we've got so many more people um, than when I started in the industry with the same goal and, and screeching from the mountaintops that if we, um, if we can all agree these are what the problems are, it's a lot easier to fix them. So um, I, I, I think it's very well taken. I hope your, you know, your listeners um, look at it from both angles, right? Because I think the, the numbers speak for themselves. It's, it's kind of really hard to argue um, with, with the statistics that, you know, we see year after year after year. Um, but you're absolutely right. The personal side, there's no greater responsibility of a leader um, than to take care of your people. And, and that has to be through actions. Yeah, I think. Proactive versus reactive is, is the key there, sure. right? For sure, absolutely. In, in everything we do, I mean, mm -hmm. we uh, on the response side of the house, right, or prevention side. I mean, yes, we're reactive that we're responding to something that has occurred, but all of the front end work, you know, the apparatus, the training, the selecting the right people, making sure they're taken care of. All that proactive is what makes us be successful when we get into a reactionary mode. So um, we need to take that same, you know, I've, I've coined it, you know, uh, on the prevention side, we've got community risk reduction is the new, um, the new name for, I guess, fire prevention. Um, on From my perspective, there's human risk reduction. I've actually written on that quite extensively. Um, that most everything we face um, as public safety, um, health and wellness issues, whether it be injuries, uh, health disabilities, uh, death, um, it's human risk reduction. So there's things we can be doing to minimize that risk um, to our, our own survival and our health. Yeah, and you talked so much about, like, you know, we, we've mentioned too uh, with other chiefs, they talk about data. And unfortunately, a lot of times it takes that that uh, one incident that, you know, changes an organization, but I, I believe every organization has those incidences, but they're just not relating it back to the health. Uh, for instance, you have someone who has an accident. Well, it could be because their, their, uh, cognition or their cognitive level is, 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 uh, decreased a little bit because they're maybe not hydrated very well, or they didn't sleep very well, or their health isn't optimal, um, or they're having other issues. So all of a sudden, you know, when you take a step back and look at it from a leadership standpoint, um, and I think you you kind of said this too, you have to look at a more broad scale. You can't just look at, okay, nobody's had a heart attack this year, so we don't need annual medicals, right? Like, um, and so let's look at, let's talk 1582 a little bit, because I think sometimes organizations, they use NFPA when they want to make an argument, and then they also use it when they don't want to make an argument. So 1582, 1583 can be very daunting. It can be like there is a lot to it. So, uh, you know, what would you tell a chief or someone who's looking at that saying, there's no way we can cover this? You know, where do you begin when you look at the NFPA and, 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 and this, in particular, 1582, 1583? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And uh... Uh, as I mentioned before, we we uh, started taping. I, I'm kind of the new guy on the block as a technical committee member uh, for NFPA. Um, so I've had the opportunity for the last year or so to, to watch, and it, you know, it's a great um, standard that is is driven through consensus, um, and, it, and it all evolves around um, our ability to health wise, medically, safely do the essential job functions of a firefighter. Um, so that I kind of look at that as like a baseline standard. Mm -hmm. Um, but we know, um, you know, there's lots of other areas. So like behavioral health now has just kind of kept, you know, come into 1582. Um, but we know there's a lot more that work that can be done on behavioral health for cancer, um, very quickly is evolving. I can't tell you how much cancer, um, at LifeScan, we see uh, close to 50,000 first responders throughout the country at LifeScan Wellness Centers. Um, and I can't tell you, uh, just I'll just use my own department, Broward County, where I retired from, uh, 900 members approximately. This last round of LifeScan physicals, we found four asymptomatic cancers um, on uh, imaging, on ultrasound imaging. So um, NFPA is a great guidance um, 
for being able to safely perform the job functions. Um, I think the the research, in fact, you know, I think my dear friend Billy Goldfeder says all the time, and he, he's spot on. Um, there's been more research on firefighter health, wellness, and safety done in the last decade and the prior 200 years. Um, so it's evolving so quickly. I mean, just at LifeScan, we, we uh, you know, take our 50,000 firefighters as a, um, a responsibility to, to use some de-identified data to help with research. Um, and, and the research is evolving so quickly. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, it, NFPA, um, you know, that, that'll that flow into NFPA may take time, but I encourage um, your listeners out there to, to seek out best practices um, because I, I really think that it, many times it's early adopters. Um, you know, it should be evidence-based, um, you know, especially if you can help with the research. Um, you know, as, as an example, um, Dr. Denise Smith just published a large report on um, sudden cardiac death. We know 80% of uh, sudden cardiac deaths in firefighters have an enlarged left ventricle or left uh, chamber of the heart um, and subclinical unidentified um, cardiac um, uh, artery disease uh, that they're walking around with. So um, her report records recommended some enhanced cardiac screenings, uh, cardiac echocardiogram, which we've been doing for 25 years at LifeScan, every physical includes one every year, um, but also a, a calcification scoring to look at plaque in your arteries um, at age 40, one, you know, one time baseline. So, um, you know, so my, my perspective is there, there really needs to be, um, you know, a, a minimum standard that every department is working to, to get to. Um, and we're not there yet. I mean, I know in um, in Janelle probably recalls this 2016, so it's it's dated um, seven years or so, six and a half. Um, IFC did a survey of its membership um, on how many departments were providing physicals. I think in, not not even NFBA, just physical, just get a physical a, in general. Yeah. Yes, and I think you know round numbers. I think about. 20% of career departments said they still weren't. I think the number was almost 40% in uh, volunteers. And it, it was somewhere in between for combo departments. So you can imagine if you said NFPA 1582 baseline, um, the numbers would even be less. And, and of that, um, you know, what What else jumped out at me? One of the results of the survey was, was one of the questions was, uh, what percent provide any type of behavioral health screening. So all the behavioral health issues that are out there, we have for the most part screening tools for them, whether it's depression, alcohol use, sleep. Um, only 10% of both career and volunteer in combination said that they had any type of screening tools. So, uh, you know, LifeScan has incorporated uh, for some time um, as part of the annual physical evidence-based screening tools uh, for behavioral health. We've now partnered in, in starting to work on work-life balance screening tools, right? Because what happens off the job, whether that's family, finances, stress, um, we bring onto the job and it has a health impact. So I, I think, um, listen, I, I wouldn't sit on the NFPA technical committee if I wasn't a believer and proponent, um, but we can we can also um, go beyond and I, and I believe identify um, best practices that will yield um, better um, health, wellness, and ultimately survival um, for for our members. I mean, if you if you look at most behavioral health issues, if you talk to the you know the house that that person's located at, someone in that house probably knows as a member struggling. Um, so if we if we provide resources, um, training, and then use uh, the, the early detection piece to help us as well, um, we can put it all together and tailor something um, to help our members um, again in a in a proactive way instead of waiting to tragedy strikes. Yeah, and I think a lot of us try to think about um, you know, and, and I've heard this from chiefs uh, and, and and you know administrators, whatever. Hey, well, I, you know, we can't follow it to a T. So we're, we're going to try to put something together and wait until we do, you know, and I think what you're saying is don't wait, get something started, get, even if it's a three question survey, fit, start figuring out how we can start integrating these things. Cause it's never going to be perfect. Some people can follow 1582. Some people 
um, are, are trying to push 1582, right? Like that's how we get better as a fire service is to not, everybody just doesn't stay at this level, right? We have to continually look and grow. And, uh, and I love your message there. You're like, Hey, yeah, y- y- do something like start some process. And there are so many resources already out there. Um, you know, I've, we've done some work with FRCE, uh, National Fall and Firefighters Foundation. I know that uh, Lexapol and Cortico have some. Life, um, LifeScan has some great resources, but there's stuff out there. Um, so we can't use 1582 as an excuse is what you're saying. Yeah, for, for sure. You know, I had a wise, again, uh, mentor who, who taught me uh, when in command, command. Um, and, and so doing nothing is never usually a good option. Um, if you get a, a, you know something in play, and it needs to be tweaked. You can always tweak it as you go. Um, you mentioned um, FRCE. So the International Association of Fire Chiefs, Safety, Health, and Survival partnered with the First Responder Center of Excellence on just this kind of gap that we're now discussing. So we created a, a two-sided front and back. It's called, the. Uh, you can look it up online and download it, the uh, – uh, Practitioner's Guide for uh, right. Annual Medicals for Firefighters. I, I may have heard of it uh, and used it and push it. All oh, I love it. And, and the, it. For your listeners out there, the intent is if you your department isn't providing an annual physical or even if they are. But, you know, I go to my my internist. I'm the only firefighter in his practice. He knows nothing about firefighter occupational health. This is a easy to read. One side of page, the other side tells them here's the risk of cancer. We recommend these additional tests. Here's, you know, sleep an issue, is an issue. You should screen for it. Here's behavioral health challenges and, and recommends um, in a short, digestible, easy bite size um, what, what clinicians need to know and what they should be considering. I mean, we know that um, if the general public needs a colonoscopy at 45, we know likely with the elevated risk for colon cancer and firefighters, clinicians need to be thinking earlier than that for firefighters. So um, if you, if you haven't seen that yet, go download that it's free of charge and it's, it's a game changer. We've actually worked. I'll give a shout out to Dr. Sarah Jenke and her team um, that, that worked very closely with our provider community um, to make sure that the messaging and the length is digestible um, to the clinician. You know, the average clinician, if you get 20 minutes in an exam room with them, you're ahead of the game. So, you know, we can't, take a lot of time. Um, this resource has QR codes. So if that provider wants to drill down even further, um, they can scan, they can go look at all the research, but if they don't have the time, it just hits the big items. You know, these are the, I'm a firefighter. Here's health wise, what you need to take into consideration. Yeah, it's actually, it's a, a great, a great resource. We'll try to link it in the show notes. And uh, one thing that I actually did is I, through my chart, I, I attached it, sent it to my doctor well before um, I do my annual medical. Um, and I do two of them. I'm kind of like you, I do one through the department, then I take it back to my own doctor. And, and, um, but it, it, it's a, like you said, it's uh, one that every single firefighter, whether you're on call paid volunteer, you need to provide to your doctor. So they understand things a little bit more. Um, but on that, let's say now, now we, we, and we, and I think we, we now, if we're aware of this, we know we have resources. Let's talk about, let's talk about implementation. How do we make ourselves more healthy? Uh, chief, like, and I know that you've taken this to heart, no pun intended there on this too, but you know, all right. So now I know I might have high cholesterol. I might have, um, you know, uh, all of a sudden, you know, uh, something that they found, um, on a cardiac, a pre-diabetic we're finding a lot, right? St- uh, the stress and, and inflammation is leading to joint pain. It's also leading to probably some problems with con- uh, cognitive function. So let's, let's talk about, you know, uh, kind of a, We'll start with a 30,000 uh, foot approach again. Now we maybe have some assessments that uh, we found some stuff. What's next? What What's your uh, take on that? Where do we go? Sure. So so um, let's start. You said 30,000. So I really look at this you know, macro level and micro level. Um, so on the macro level, we know there's fire service trends, right? So Dr. Janke can tell you. Um, you know, the, the prevalence of obesity in the fire service is greater than it is in general population. Um, so we know we've got an obesity problem. How do you change that, right? So, you know, we implement programs, healthy eating, nutrition, uh, fitness. 
Um, so there's that macro level that um, you can just search out uh, on the internet. What are the what are the key drivers of firefighter health risk? Um, and that outlines your wellness program for you. You know, there's uh, folks that have already done this for you. The Health and Wellness Initiative is out there with uh, IFC, IFF. Um, at at LifeScan, um, what we do uh, as well is for every uh, of the 600 and some odd departments we provide physicals for, we give the department de-identified high-level 30,000 for aggregate data. So Broward County, 900 of your members went through. Um, 60 of them had stage one hypertension. Um, 50 of them had an A1C greater than seven for glucose. Um, five of them had um, uh, testicular masses that required follow-up. Um, so as, a, as an agency, you know, you can look at here's where we need to do a better job with health and align your resources with the risk. Mm, yeah. um, you know, at Broward, when, when I was there, um, you know, the driving fact, I went to HR and, and comp and said, where are we spending all of our money reactionary wise? And it was, you know, diabetes, cholesterol, um, uh, cardiac events. Um, and, and when you peeled the onion all back, it was all related to obesity weight. So we implemented, you know, brought in registered dietitians, taught everyone how to cook healthy. We implemented some incentive programs for fitness. Um, so there's that 30,000 foot level. Um, and, and at LifeSkin, we customize it to the department. But if you, if you don't have that resource, um, there's a pretty clear picture out there right now on the health issues confronting the fire service that um, can be addressed. Then the micro issue um, is really that personal accountability, right? And that, and that's where every, um, everything we do, um, you know, if, if, um, um, it's, it's every profession, right? The, the difference is, and I'll just use one example, um, hypertension, um, in a, in a, a teacher, uh, and I love teachers. I've learned a lot from teachers over the years. Um, it's different for their survival than hypertension in a firefighter we know has approximately eight to 12 fold increase in sudden cardiac death um, on the fire ground. So we need to, we need to hold ourselves and each other accountable. Um, I forget who I'm going to quote here and whoever I quoting and I didn't reference your name. I apologize. Um, but there's a beautiful quote that, that I've incorporated um, in, in much of my discussions with folks saying, when you hit the fire ground, and, you know, whether that's, you know, traffic accident up on the highway, whether that's a commercial structure, um, your risk becomes everyone's risk, yeah. right? So if, you know, you haven't managed your blood pressure um, or, you know, you haven't kept up with your fitness um, and, and you go down in the fire ground, now we've got a whole nother circum set of circumstances that are putting not just uh, the mission at stake, but um, all your brother and sister firefighters um, on stake on that same uh, fire ground um, for what should have been preventable. So we've got to we've got to hold each other accountable, and it's the same with whatever everything we do, right? If we're gonna, if we have a, a at the macro level a policy saying you're gonna do multi-company drill three times a week, um, at the you know company level, at the battalion level, if we don't uh, have accountability to make sure we're doing that. Um, it's going to show in our performance, um, you know, so it's the same with health. If I, if I see a department that has, you know, a lot of preventable health issues happening, it, it sets alarms off to me that either they don't have the resources um, in place or they're not either embracing them or um, holding themselves accountable. And, and I'm not a big, um, you know, I guess there's two ways of approaching um, life and, and, um, behavioral change, you know, one's the carrot and one's the stick. Um, you know, but I, I'm a big proponent of, listen, we, we, we trust firefighters to drive a million to tower ladder. Um, and in many cases, it paramedics administering, you know, uh, rapid sequence induction at three in the morning. And for the most part, they do a great job. Um, so I trust that if we, um, if we share people, share with people, the the health risk that they have, the consequences of not addressing them. I, I have complete confidence that most all firefighters are going to take the steps to, to do the right thing for not not just themselves but their family. 
um, it, and their coworkers. And I, I think family sometimes gets overlooked. I know Mike Hamrock, uh, Boston's fire uh, physician, from early on always included the families in some of the health risk discussions with um, the members. And sometimes it just takes the spouse to, um, that, that one chief I mentioned at the Metro chief where we found his kidney cancer, he adamantly did not want to come and have a, an ultrasound done by life scan. His wife dragged him uh, at the conference and, and ultimately that's what identified his cancer. So we need to think of this as a whole unit because literally the family, as you know, um, the family, if we don't have good support networks, we're not going to change behaviors. So yeah. a, a lot of this is about behavioral change and behavioral modification as well. Yeah. And, and I, I like, um, you know, and I, I'm kind of a Forrest Gump, uh, uh, <laughs> kind of approach to a lot. And, and one thing that just came to mind, you, you said, Hey, your health issue becomes my health issue. Once you show up at the firehouse and I, I all of a sudden at, it just pictured to me, if you're putting a, a, a ladder up to the second floor for egress, if someone's in there, but you only put it halfway up and don't reach the window, that's an issue that we will call anybody out on in a second. Yet, if you're not getting your annual medical, don't take care of yourself and you don't know what, you know, what your health risks are, nobody's saying a word about that. And that's just like having a ladder not reach its target. Even worse in some cases when you look at the data, right? Right? Like, I mean, that's basically the message that we all need to embrace, right, Chief? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and the, you know, the, the challenge of it is not all of it is visible. Um, you can see the ladder. Uh, you know, you're, you can't see the person next to you's hypertension um, in, in most cases. So that's why that, that personal accountability has to come in. And, and I'm a big proponent, like I said, I'm a big proponent of the carrot um, that, that I think we need to incentivize when we can. Um, a lot of these programs and resources and um, how do we incentivize people to, to be healthy? And, and you would think intuitively it's just survival. Um, yeah. But again, it's behavior change. If I've got um, blood pressure issues, um, I'm probably more motivated knowing that as a firefighter, I've got eight to 12 times higher risk of sudden death because of that, if I don't control it. So a lot of, I mean, we spend a lot of time in, in the three hour physical that we do at LifeScan, just sitting down and having these conversations when we find um, an issue that, that needs to be addressed, just getting the, the member to, to understand the importance. Again, our profession is uniquely um, different than almost any other profession out there with regards to its impact on health and survival. Yeah, and you know, just going with our metaphors here, I'm going to throw out another one. Um, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Like that's, I think that's a big part of the personal accountability is people can feel very overwhelmed by everything they feel like they have to do and hitting all these benchmarks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but, um, you know, for me personally, I know that sleep is a huge um, hurdle for me when it comes to health and wellness. I literally told my husband yesterday, okay, my goal this week is to go to bed early every night. Like, because I, I just, I know that that's what sets me up for success. I'm going to be 10 times more likely to eat healthy or go for a walk if I'm not just completely destroyed by the end of the day with exhaustion. Um, but I think that's a big part of it for folks is just doing one little thing first. And I mean, I think Aaron, you mentioned that earlier, even from the department standpoint, like start somewhere, like pick something, do something. But, you know, that's a big theme on this show too, on the personal, on the micro side, start somewhere. For me this week, it's going to be t going to bed earlier, you know, but it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing that, you know, um, the, the old adage of 1% gain, change every day. If you do 1% a little better every day, it adds up to a big number um, at, at the end. So uh, whether it's the one bite of an elephant at a time, it's, um, you know, uh, when I was training for half marathon, I had I had someone give me some great advice. You know, you start by putting one foot in front of the other and then the next day put another, you know. So um, again, you've got to have that, um, you got to get started, right? To, to compete in any race, you have to start. Um, you know, and it, one thing we haven't talked about, I know we're running on time, but, um, I want to put a plug in there for, um, 
for the uh, FEMA assistance to firefighter grants as well. That's a tremendous resource um, to fund a lot of the things we've talked about today. Um, sadly, I think FEMA um, would tell you what they've told me, which is only about of all the requests that they get for funding, uh, only about 3% or so have anything to do with firefighter health and wellness or fitness. Um, so for your listeners out there, um, it, it's a great way to take a lot of the programs that uh, can be put in place in your department, fund them, um, see some quick results, and, and really um, bring those resources to your members uh, to, for their for their safety. Yep. And I'll, I'm going to incentivize that further because I think, Chief, you're, you're exactly on that. that um, and when you do this, throw in, you throw in annual medicals. But I also think, uh, too, I've also, uh, in conversations uh, with some certain individuals that are on these committees or whatever, they're also saying, throw in education on this. Throw in uh, developing resources. And I believe, too, you know, write the grant, and then uh, we're going to have you on, and you're going to tell us about your success stories. So then, then you have to share it with everyone else. Like, hey, this is what you did, and this is, this is I, I think, um, uh, like you said, utilize the grants, utilize uh, the resources around. Uh, you don't have to recreate the wheel, but just start, start that wheel moving. Um, lastly, you know, for someone that's listening personally, and they, they're, maybe they're saying, okay, regardless of, of the department and the culture, you know, what are three things you would tell people to do to help change their own fitness culture? Yeah. So that, that's a, um, you know, very individualized, um, question, right? So I, I think, um, I think Janelle kind of hit on this is we're, we're all likely on different steps of our fitness journey, our health and wellness journey. Um, you know, my, my health is different, um, at, my age today than it was when I started at age 16 with my EMT training. <laughs> um, so, that, so I, I think the first thing I would say is you, you got to have a base, you got to get a baseline, right? So again, we wouldn't jump into an apparatus. I knowingly, I would hope not knowing the fluid levels, not knowing the tank, you know, um, not knowing that it's fueled up. Um, so we need to, we need to get a baseline um, health status assessment. Um, and that, again, everything we've talked about today, you can measure most anything about your health, right? So whether it's, you know, Janelle's talking about sleep, that's a huge issue that's correlated with cancer, cardiac behavior. We can actually, and we do it at LifeScape, we can actually um, score um, sleep disorder and then figure out what to do about it. So get a baseline, comprehensive look at your health. That's the first thing. Um Two is identify where the gaps are, right? So probably very few people have perfect health, whether it's cholesterol, weight, sleep. Um, figure out where your issues are relative to um, guidance from your health provider and the work we do, right? So we, we talked about, you know, sleep for us is different than maybe another profession. Hypertension is different. And then the third part is, is what we talked about is uh, – is take that first step and uh, begin begin the journey um, and then repeat the cycle, right? So I, I know uh, at, at the end of the day, I've got, you know, my issues are hypertension, cholesterol, um, always working on weight. Um, so I know what my baseline is and where I should be. Um, I know what I need to do to, to work towards the goal. Um, and then if it's not quite where I need to be, you come back and refine it um, in whatever that looks like. So again, macro level, the departments need to be um, providing resources uh, to, to address the, you mentioned sleep. Um, you know, in Broward, we brought in a, a sleep um, specialist, physician specialist to teach every member about sleep hygiene. There are certain things you can do, temperature, light, uh, getting rid of electronics, alcohol, um, DCing. Uh, um, so we can we can make effect change, but um, macro level, the departments, micro level individuals, you need to know what your baseline is and what to be working on. So great question. And, uh, um, you know, I, I encourage, um, it's a journey, right? I encourage every one of your listeners and members of the service to every journey begins with the first step, as Janelle said. Yeah, you just and then you said repeat it. It is uh, it changes as you know your your twenty two year old self in the fire service 
uh, changes uh, or has a different approach than maybe your 30 or 40 or 52 year old self. And that's okay. But just keep evaluating and, and stepping forward uh, with it. I think that's a, a, a very good summary. Um, and, and as far as uh, speaking about moving forward, you're not done yet with the show, uh, even with all the great information that you've given us as far as um, you know, where to begin utilizing resources, uh, looking at a macro to micro level. We also do these things that are more of a micro level here. They're called hot seat questions. We, we try to think, you know, something quick hitters, some personal questions for you. Um, Janelle loves to come up with these questions. We actually consult our mothers on this one quite a bit. And uh, Janelle's got some good ones for you today, Chief. I can't wait. I can't wait. I'm strapped in. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, Chief. I think you mentioned uh, training for a marathon or half marathon. Half marathon. I'm just curious, curious if you have a favorite sport um, or one that you participate in regularly. So... Um... For, for myself, uh, as a spectator, I love watching football. I'm a football uh, fanatic on, on Sundays. Um, for, for myself, it's changed over as uh, over the time of my career. So um, I went from a, a really uh, focusing on uh, running and doing uh, charity uh, competitive races um, and I had a lot of fun with that. I mentioned that um, I did, I've done it both ways. I've done a triathlon. I didn't train for it all. And that didn't work out so well. Been there, uh, done that too. Yeah, not good. Um, I, I almost drowned. Fortunately, I had great people right next to me. Um, and then, and then I trained for you know a f- half a marathon and, and had a great experience. Um, but at you know again, different journey. So as uh, I've aged, um, you know my fitness is still you know I want to practice what I preach. Um, so now it's just part of my my routine every day is to get an hour of cardio in. Um, and that's just race walking for me. I mean, I'll, I'll do, um, you know, five miles, four and a half miles, take an hour, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, keeps the weight off, keeps my uh, cholesterol where it needs to be, helps with the blood pressure. I sleep better at night, all the issues we've talked about. Um, so again, you know, I, in every station in the country has the same dynamic, you know, and I'm sure, you know, um, you've got the CrossFit station, you've got the sedentary station. Um, and you've got the station in the middle, um, and no matter what station you're at, it, it's just you know take that next step. So if if the sedentary station means you do a walk around the the firehouse, and then the next shift you do two walks around, um, it's just that routine and, and building upon it. So um, um, complacency in the fire service kills, um, and that's the same with our health as well. Complacency if we become complacent. Um, about our health and don't address it, um, it, it never has a good ending. Where do you look uh, for another hot seat question here, Chief? Where do you look for motivation? Where do you get your motivation to stay healthy? Um, you know, you know, I really, um, two, twofold is one family, right? So if, if um, you know, you, you value the ones that love you, co-workers, family, um, then in order to be there for them and enjoy that relationship, you need to take care of yourself. Um, and secondly, you know, I, I look at um, a, a duty to, um, you know, if you're going to be a prophet in the fire service about um, the importance of um, health and wellness and survival, um, then you really have to uh, lead by example, right? So I, um, I I really take that to heart. And in the back of my mind, again, I, I think about if we're losing repetitively, um, you know, members of the service from the same preventable causes. Um, it motivates me not only to get out and to um, increase awareness, um, but it also motivates me personally that in order to, to be taken at um, street cred on that, then, um, you know, I, I have to really um, walk the walk, if you will, walk the talk, I guess. <laughs> What's something this past few weeks that's made you proud? Wow, that's a um, that's a very introspective uh, question. I, you know, I I would say um, on a professional um, level, it's seeing um, those that I've had the opportunity to mentor um, along the way um, succeed. Um, 
in now be in roles where they're able to affect leadership change um, and bring the opportunity to do good. You know, I have the, probably the same mentor I've mentioned a couple of times in the episode today um, also taught me when it's within your power to do good, uh, to do good. Um, so it's, it's most rewarding for me when I see even on, you know, whether it's the IFC board of directors, we've got, you know, I've been on almost for two decades. I just ran for reelection. Um, but we've got, you know, young, um, young new blood coming up behind and it's just very rewarding for me. And I know others like chief Goldfeather and others um, that are colleagues and friends, um, be able to mentor and hopefully pass the baton, um, to the next generation, um, that will continue um, to, to move the needle and the dial on this to a, I, I'm not sure we'll ever get to a completely, um, you know, a spot where there's no risk in the fire service, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. So um, with that, that's probably been my most rewarding is to know that there's great talent um, that, that's out there and is stepping up to the plate. You mentioned the next generation, so this fits perfectly with my next question. Uh, what is uh, one lasting piece of advice you wish you would have followed and that you would give your younger self in the fire service? Um, you know, I, probably probably the easiest one, um, and I think what was the most impactful um, to me personally in a, in a leadership role um, is to, you know, there was a time in my career being introspective where I was very hard charging and uh, very much uh, mission driven and, uh, you know, called balls and strikes or little shades of gray. Um, and, and I again, had some great mentoring that it's all about people, right? So um, it's how you take care of um, your people. So people won't necessarily remember all your great accomplishments, um, what they will remember is how you treated them. Um, and, and that goes for not only the public were sworn to serve, um, back to the Mrs. Smith and how we treat Mrs. Smith and her family, um, uh, but each other as well. Um, and that, that goes to everything from just making sure that we take care of, um, each other holistically. So if someone is struggling or someone needs course correction, um, we, we look out for each other, you know, whether on the behavioral health side, we've got peer support programs on, uh, you know, someone just, if it's a leadership issue, you know, pull that person aside and, and just have an honest, caring, loving conversation with them that makes them a better firefighter, a better human, a better officer. So, um, uh, to me, that was life altering and it, it transcended just the job. It, it really, um, I went from kind of transactional relationships um, to, to being more, um, grounded in getting to learn who that person was that, that I put my life in their hands and I put theirs in, in mine and make sure that we're, we're all, um, taking, looking out for each other. And I think that summarizes just about everything that you, you talked about too, is that when you look at, you know, people helping each other, um, you know, that starts with your own self, right? And whether departments can develop, uh, you know, programming, there, there are resources there for them and, and be proactive. Don't be reactive with it and similar with, with each individual. Um, and, and so chief, so very well said, thank you so much for your insight. And, um, I know I got a lot out of this. I, I'm very sure that our listeners did also, um, for those that are listening to us, you can also watch us and you can see Chief in action here um, on our YouTube channel on, or at firerescue1.com. You can email us at uh, better every shift at firerescue1.com. Again, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Um, hopefully the, you took uh, some really usable motivation, some usable advice from uh, Chief LaDuke. I know I did. Most importantly, uh, make sure that you take care of yourself so you can take care of others and uh, make sure to learn something, do something, share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody.